much and thank you for the invitation. Um, understanding how language is represented in the human brain has a long history in brain science. Aphasia lesion localization began with the work of Paul Broca in the 19th century, and it's still actively investigated to this day. However, we really can't overemphasize the importance of um, contemporary neuroimaging techniques in enlarging our view of language organization in the brain. Functional neuroimaging techniques such as fMRI and PET have allowed us to observe brain activity in areas that are active as participants actually use language. Using functional connectivity analyses, we can track the conjoint activation of several different brain regions in both healthy people as well as in those with injured brains. Advanced structural imaging techniques using high resolution fMRI allow us to more precisely measure lesion localization um, after brain injury. And using DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, we can um, image structural um, connectivity using, along white matter pathways that connect language relevant brain regions. As a result, over about the past 20 years, our view of language in the brain has been greatly expanded. And we've come to appreciate just how dynamic this system is as we engage in various linguistic activities. So um, what I'm going to try to do in my talk today is to provide a broad overview of current thinking on language organization in the brain. In the preparation for this talk, I was guided by recently published meta-analyses and review articles that attempt to distill what we've learned so far. Um, but I want to make it clear that this is my own personal interpretation of the current state of the field based on, um, I hasten to say, over 30 years of, uh, as a student of and a contributor to the study of language organization in the brain. So why don't we start out with the classical view of language in the brain. When most people think of language in the brain, they think of Broca's area in the left inferior frontal cortex and Wernicke's area in the posterior part of the left um, temporal cortex. The thumbnail sketch is that Broca's area is involved with language expression, and Wernicke's area is responsible for comprehending language. A white matter pathway, the arcuate fasciculus, is usually said to connect uh, these two language relevant regions and to mediate their coordination. Actually, though, this is an oversimplification of the classical view of language in the brain. It's usually acknowledged that surrounding areas, as well as areas that provide sensory motor um, access to the language regions, are part of the left hemisphere's language system. We can call this the textbook view of language in the brain because it often appears in introductory works. Now I want to contrast this with a recently published compendium of fMRI data that illustrates brain areas that are active during language use. First thing to say is don't worry, I'm not going to describe every one of those colored blobs. <laughs> but the point here is to indicate that the, what we think of as the classical language regions really represent just the tip of the iceberg in terms of how the brain subserves language. And it's worth pointing out that even this illustration is incomplete because it only shows regions within the left side of the brain. So I'm going to structure the rest of my talk as follows. I'm going to concentrate on four themes that have emerged from um, contemporary language brain research. First, a number of regions outside of the classical language areas are now known to be recruited for various language functions. So I'm going to describe um, several of these and um, to describe how they exemplify our notions, how our notions of language relevant cortex have been greatly expanded in recent years. Secondly, I'll describe parallel pathways that are involved with language use. For both speech and reading, processing unfolds along two separate pathways with differing functions. And I'll try to give you an introduction to the what and the where of these parallel streams of language information processing. Third, I'll also discuss language networks, that is, interconnected brain areas that function together to perform various language tasks. I'm using the plural um, by intention here because there's no single language network. Rather, there's a confederation of partially overlapping networks, each of which is recruited in different task situations. 
And then finally, I'll describe how activity within any of these language networks changes in response to task demands and individual differences in order to illustrate the dynamic nature of language processing in the human brain. So what are some of these newly recognized language areas? Well, first I want us to consider an area that's um, clearly outside of the classical language zone, but that plays an important part in reading. So what I'm showing you here is just the medial surface of the brain, if you sliced it down from front to back and looked inside. And we see a gyrus that is um, highlighted in yellow here, the fusiform gyrus, in the inferior part of the temporal lobe. The posterior part of that gyrus, um, as it goes in, it, it's sort of a transition between temporal and occipital cortex, is sometimes referred to as the visual word form area. <clears throat> um, and it, this has been shown to be, play an important role in early stages of reading. Here again, we're looking at the bottom surface of the brain and highlighted here is regions of activation from fMRI studies of the so-called visual word form area. Numerous fMRI studies have indicated that this area is activated when we present visual words or letter strings that approximate words. Um, we call these pseudo words. Activity in this part of the brain codes for spelling regularities or the orthography of the language. And oftentimes we see activation greater for an actual word, a familiar word, than a pseudo word. Some have hypothesized that this region extracts the visual form of words. However, it, this doesn't have to imply that, only word, that words are the only visual patterns that are processed in this part of the brain. When patients have brain injury that damages this area or disrupts input into the area, they can have very profound difficulty reading words. Many of these people can only read on a letter-by-letter -letter basis. So if they were to see a, 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 the printed word cat, they would approach it this way, C-A-T-O, cat, okay? So basically what they're doing then is recognizing each individual letter in order to be able to um, identify the whole word string. Of course, a strategy like this, this letter-by-letter -letter reading, would be of very little use for reading connected text. So they are ending up with very profound reading difficulties. So this tells us that this left inferior temporal occipital area is clearly essential for reading, even though it was not considered to be one of the classical language areas. Addi an additional region um, that has been shown to be relevant for language is the insula. And this is a part of the cortex that's buried or hidden beneath the lateral surface. So what I'm showing you here is a dissection of the left hemisphere that exposes the insula. <clears throat> Actually, Wernicke originally speculated that the insula might be um, involved in language function, but the idea really wasn't pursued much for a very long time. However, a number of recent findings have suggested that, in fact, the anterior part of the left insula, insula does play an important role in language. And here I'm just highlighting the anterior part of the left insula, which has been the, the part that's been most implicated for language function. So what are some of the supporting findings? Well, initially there was a very uh, surprising finding from a modern lesion localization study done by Dronkers. Um, that data indicated that patients who had speech production problems were most likely to have brain injury in the insula rather than in other areas of the left hemisphere. Later on, neuroimaging research with healthy individuals um, confirmed a role for this area in the articulation of speech. Currently, the extent to which the insula is involved in wider language functions is under active investigation. It probably is involved with things beyond articulation, but um, that's where we have the strongest evidence at the moment. In addition, um, research from my lab and other labs <clears throat> has um, demonstrated that this anterior part of the left insula is structurally asymmetrical, like other language-relevant regions with greater surface area in the, on the left side of the brain than on the right side of the brain. But what was particularly interesting was that the asymmetry of the insular structure 
was correlated with functional language asymmetry, so functional differences between the left and the right sides, whereas the asymmetry for more classical language areas like Broca's and Wernicke's area was not associated with functional language lateralization. So this probably implies a critical role for the insula in the establishment of the left hemisphere language network. Wernicke's area is generally described as the uh, posterior part of the superior temporal gyrus. However, it's now clear that other parts of the temporal cortex might be even more important for our ability to understand language. The posterior part of the middle temporal gyrus, shown in yellow here, is actually more critical for language comprehension than classical Wernicke's area, which is shown in this bright green here. When patients have injury that's restricted to this left middle temporal gyrus, they have severe, severe impairments in understanding words and sentences when they're spoken. And their comprehension difficulties are worse than patients who have brain injury in any other part of the left hemisphere. Okay. This same region of the left hemisphere is also consistently activated in healthy individuals when they engage in verbal semantic tasks that require the comprehension of words. And this was demonstrated in a meta-analysis of over 100 studies that was published by Binder. More recently, uh, a very elegant DTI study, diffusion tensor imaging, indicated that this part of the middle temporal cortex was more strongly um, connected anatomically to the other language regions than any other part of the left hemisphere, implying that it's a very key component in the left hemisphere language comprehension network. So now if we travel more towards the front of the brain, still within the temporal lobe, Okay, um, and look at this anterior temporal lobe region, which is, again, rather distant from Wernicke's area. We come to another part of the brain that's been shown to be important for um, subserving the meaning part of language. This part of the brain is a focus of degeneration in a condition called semantic dementia. Patients who have semantic dementia have severe naming deficits, and they have great difficulty producing names in spontaneous speech. Testing reveals that their problems with naming are actually not due to word retrieval problems, but rather to the progressive loss of semantic or meaningful knowledge. Um, in such patients, the anterior temporal lobe degeneration is usually bilateral, left and right. However, it's generally more severe in the left hemisphere. Now, up until very recently, it's been difficult to get a good uh, view, a good functional view of this part of the temporal lobe just due to its anatomical location when using fMRI. However, very recently, a study by Visser and colleagues uh, was able to surmount the technical challenges and actually do a re really fine fMRI study of this part of the cortex. And what they found was that the same anterior uh, temporal lobe region was um, highly activated in healthy participants in tasks that required meaning judgments. So an example of a meaning judgment that they used in this study, uh, someone would either see a picture of a pyramid or the word pyramid, and then they would have two choices. Um, and the choices could either be words or pictures, but one choice was a fir tree, an evergreen tree, and the other was a palm tree. And the task was to pick which picture or which word went better with the pyramid. Okay, so it's really a test of semantic or meaningful knowledge. Okay. And they found um, similar activation in this anterior temporal region, regardless of whether the stimuli were words or pictures, which implies that this area may be an amodal region for processing meaning. It's generally accepted that concepts are represented in our brain in a distributed way throughout the cortex. So for a concept like dog, Visual features associated with dog would be stored in visual association cortex, and uh, doggy type actions would be stored in brain areas that mediate actions. Um, emotional features associated with dogs would be stored in limbic cortex, and so on. So in this little cartoon here, the distributed features are just represented as these colored ellipses. 
it's been proposed that the anterior temporal lobe area functions as a hub to link together all of these diverse um, features uh, for various concepts. And such linkages would enable us to make semantic generalizations and classifications. Okay. So far, everything I've described has been focused within the left hemisphere. However, the traditional view of language is the sole province of the left hemisphere has also been overturned. Even before the neuroimaging revolution, there was some acknowledgement that the right side of the brain also was involved in some language activities. For example, patients who have right-sided injury, brain injury, can have difficulty understanding intonation or the melodic content of speech. And they also experience problems interpreting non-literal language, as well as the pragmatic implications of various speech acts. So in other words, they have difficulty whenever the underlying message differs from the actual literal um, content of the words being expressed. In addition, lateralization research with split brain and healthy individuals also has documented right hemisphere language capacity. So for example, my lab and other labs have demonstrated a broader activation of word meanings within the right side of the brain than within the left side of the brain. So it probably shouldn't have been surprising to us that when people began doing functional neuroimaging studies of language that they actually observed frequently bilateral activation. Um, typically, the activity is, of course, more extensive and um, to a greater extent within the left hemisphere, but actually um, right hemisphere brain activity during language processing is more the rule than the exception. And throughout my talk, I'll give several different examples to um, support this idea of a more bilateral system for processing at least some types of language. But so far, this view um, that I've expressed so far of um, an expansion of the language areas isn't really all that satisfactory, because just adding a bunch of areas to a list doesn't really provide any kind of big picture idea about how language is organized in the brain. Um, but accompanying this um, finding that many regions of the brain are relevant for language um, is the discovery of parallel pathways for language processing. And this brings me to the second theme of my talk. Support for the parallel um, streams of information processing view comes from um, both functional and structural imaging of normal individuals, I should say healthy individuals, and um, brain injured individuals. Um, for both speech as well as reading, we can identify distinct types of processing that occur along dorsal and ventral pathways within the brain. So when we're talking about brain anatomy, dorsal just refers to areas more towards the top, ventral more areas towards the bottom. Okay. The dorsal and the ventral pathways um, both begin in sensory cortex, whether we're talking about auditory cortex or visual cortex, and then they diverge. So the dorsal stream proceeds through parietal and um, frontal cortex, while the ventral stream proceeds through more inferior um, temporal lobe areas in a posterior to anterior direction. Okay. So um, in order to illustrate this view of parallel streams of information processing, I'm going to um, describe to you the model of Hickok and Popel. Okay. Um, according to their model, the, dors the major function of the dorsal stream is to map sounds onto action while the ventral stream maps sounds onto meaning. Both of the streams begin bilaterally in the auditory cortex, which is shown in green here. And in, within the auditory cortex, of course, there are acoustic analyses of speech. Within the ventral stream, areas near the superior temporal sulcus, shown in yellow here, um, perform phonological or language-specific sound analyses of the acoustic signal. Then these phonological representations provide access to word meaning through the inferior temporal cortex, which is shown in this magenta here. Note that this part of the ventral stream is postulated to occur bilaterally in, on both sides of the brain. 
Within the left hemisphere then, the final sort of path of the ventral pathway is in this more anterior region that is um, involved with extracting meaning across an entire sentence. So then, the, vent, the major function of the ventral pathway start with the sound and end up with a full representation of the meaning. And I want to point out to you the prominence of these temporal lobe areas beyond Wernicke's area within the ventral stream. So now let's consider the dorsal stream, which is shown in blue here. Again, we start with the audio, acoustic processing in the auditory cortex. Um, but next, there's a region at the boundary of the temporal and parietal cortex right here um, in the left hemisphere that provides an interface or a mapping between acoustic and phonological representations and the articulatory system within the frontal cortex. So the articulatory system includes Broca's area, the underlying anterior insula, as well as more dorsal um, parts of the um, frontal cortex. The dorsal stream functions to translate heard speech into an articulatory code. And this involves a segmental analysis of speech, which does not occur for the sound to meaning links that go through the ventral pathway. Um, note as well that the dorsal pathway is only hypothesized to be um, operating within the left side of the brain. So um, again, the function of the dorsal pathway is to map sounds onto actual um, articulation. The dorsal and the ventral pathways um, are going to be used in parallel when, they, when we hear speech, with the dorsal stream performing sensory motor and segmental analyses, while the ventral pathway subserves semantic and conceptual processes. Now, I haven't said anything about grammar or syntax. Actually, recent evidence suggests that these types of grammatical analyses occur within each of the processing streams. And it's currently under debate whether there are actual differences in the kinds of grammatical processing that occur within the dorsal and the ventral stream. But one proposal that makes some sense is that the dorsal stream mediates more sequential analyses of the syntax, while the ventral stream is processing and rapidly identifying grammatical violations that might occur. So I've talked to you about functional evidence for the um, dorsal and, and ventral pathways. But there's also some very nice anatomical evidence supporting the idea that there are actual white matter pathways that can serve as conduits of communication between these dorsal and uh, ventral streams. So what we're seeing here are axon bundles within the arcuate fasciculus, shown in blue, which is going to connect areas within the frontal and posterior areas of the dorsal stream. And then another pathway, the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, which has two um, subdivisions here, okay, actually connects areas within the ventral root. So there's both anatomical and functional evidence supporting the idea of these parallel language pathways. Parallel pathways have also um, been identified for reading. And the focus of this research is on how visual words are decoded. Functional neuroimaging research suggests that when we read, there's differential processing of the visual words um, in the ventral stream involving the temporal occipital cortex, inferior temporal occipital cortex, the so-called visual word form area that we talked about earlier, as well as the dorsal, a dorsal pathway that goes, that is involved with, um, that, I should say that again, the dorsal um, pathway which includes parietal and um, posterior superior temporal areas. Now, as we saw earlier, okay, the ventral pathway is um, the ventral region is more strongly activated for words than for letter-like word strings, pseudo-words, and it functions to extract spelling regularities across the entire word. So this pathway is thought to process letters in parallel as we read and to subserve rapid whole word reading. However, the dorsal stream provides another way in which words can be read. Within the dorsal area, 
um, we find greater activation for pseudo words than for familiar words. And this pathway has been shown to subserve a slower, more segmental type of word decoding in which individual letters are serially mapped onto phonemes prior to recognizing the word. In children, the dorsal area predominates early in reading acquisition as children develop phonological awareness and learn to sound out letters. However, the ventral path becomes increasingly important as, with development as reading fluency and reading skill increases. However, even in, the, in a fluent adult reader, the dorsal system is still available and is still used. And this was demonstrated nicely um, by a recent study that looked at the effects of degrading visual words. And they degraded the words in ways that would disrupt the, disrupt the ability to see the whole word form or to process the whole word form. So they um, rotated the words from their normal horizontal orientation or sometimes um, placed abnormal spaces in between letters in the word. And when they did that, they found increased activation within the dorsal region. Okay. The idea here is that the words can no longer be recognized as familiar visual patterns and have to be read in this more sequential way. Okay. Um, I'll just, as an aside here, an interesting um, finding with respect to the dorsal and ventral pathways with respect to children who have developmental reading problems. Um, many of these children have problems with phonological awareness and the ability to sound out words. So it was originally thought that the, um, we would see abnormal activation within the dorsal pathway. And in fact, that was found. Um, children who have difficulty learning to read have reduced area, uh, levels of activation within the dorsal stream. However, they also have reduced activation within the ventral stream, which was surprising. Okay. And the idea here is that we actually need to have a functioning dorsal pathway in order to bootstrap the whole word reading that may, is probably occurring within the ventral pathway. So in addition to having both of these areas of the brain being underactivated, children with developmental reading problems also tend to have other areas of the brain be at um, unusually high levels of activation, areas within the right hemisphere and within different areas of the frontal cortex. Okay. So in general, both across speech and reading, the ventral pathways predominate for rapid word analysis, while the dorsal pathways are involved with slower, more analytical processes that require segmenting the language input. So one important feature of language organization in the brain is the divergence of information processing into these two parallel streams. So it should be clear by now that there's lots of different brain regions that are important and utilized for language. However, this does not mean that each one of these areas is brought into play in all language contexts. Rather, the evidence suggests that somewhat different networks of brain areas are recruited depending on the type of linguistic activity that we are engaged in at the moment. And this brings me to the third theme of my talk. Any language activity requires an interconnected network of synchronized brain areas that function together. We can investigate this using functional connectivity analyses. And what functional connectivity analyses do is to take the actual fMRI signal and process it in a way to identify brain areas whose activity changes in concert. So in other words, areas whose activation rise and fall at the same time. These areas then represent a functional network or a coalition of brain areas that work together to perform a particular task. So um, let's start with considering functional connectivity when people listen to speech. In a recent study by Sauer and colleagues, participants heard three types of sentences. Meaningful sentences, sentences with pseudo-words that replaced the real words but otherwise had normal sentence structure, and the pseudo-sentences played in reverse. Now, when you play speech or pseudo-speech in reverse, you will present the person with the exact same acoustic content as the normal speech. However, the content can't be processed using the phonology of a language. Okay. 
Um, so then when we compare the pseudo sentences, um, I should say when we compare the activation for the pseudo sentences to those for the reversed pseudo sentences, then it will reveal brain areas that are processing the phonological content of the sentence devoid of meaning. Okay, because neither of them have any meaning. And we would expect to see greater activation for the pseudo sentences. When we compare the meaningful to the pseudo sentences, however, then we can see a network of areas that corresponds to the semantic or meaningful content of the spoken message. And we would expect to see greater activation for the more meaningful sentences relative to the pseudo sentences. So what I'm showing you here is the strength of the functional connectivity for five relevant language areas that are labeled um, in the diagram. The phonological network is shown in A and the semantic network is shown in B. Note that the phonological network is only found within the left hemisphere, whereas the semantic network is more bilateral. However, the um, correlations between the brain areas are definitely stronger within the left hemisphere than within the right. Um, there were also very strong um, functional connectivity between corresponding areas in the left and the right hemisphere for the semantic network. So areas, in other words, a strong functional connectivity between this area and this area, and so on. So these data support somewhat different functional networks for extracting the phonological versus the semantic content of sentences. One coalition of brain areas processes the phonology, another coalition processes meaning. The investigators went further and used diffusion tensor imaging to identify the white matter pathways that underlie these networks. And these analyses revealed um, both dorsal and ventral connections for the phonological pathways, okay, and ventral connections exclusively for the semantic network. So then functional connectivity analyses go beyond identifying what are critical regions for language and they reveal which regions are activated in synchrony as we engage in different language activities. So there isn't just a single language network, but multiple language networks in the brain. And which networks are utilized depends on characteristics of the task and of the individual. Um, for example, another recent study um, examined the processing of spoken sentences again, but now contrasting sentences that had emotional content and emotional intonation with sentences that were emotionally neutral. In both conditions, okay, so the emotional as well as the more neutral sentences, there was a bilateral, um, at the functional connectivity analyses revealed bilateral networks um, for processing both types of sentences, okay. And these were on the lateral surfaces of the left and right hemispheres. However, in addition to these regions, areas on the medial surface of the left and right hemispheres were activated only for processing the sentences that expressed an emotion. Okay. These additional areas of the brain are um, from other studies associated with theory of mind and the ability to make inferences about other people's emotional states. So these um, kind of results illustrate that language networks are dynamically altered depending on the message that's being expressed. We've already seen that many brain regions can be involved in language and that subsets of these regions are organized into multiple partially overlapping functional networks. My final theme is that functional connectivity within these networks can be modulated by task demands and individual differences. And I'll mention just two recent studies that illustrate this point. So consider what happens when we are hearing two people uh, express two different messages at the same time. Um, Bookwhites and colleagues did an interesting study and they found that about one third of the people that they tested could successfully comprehend two messages simultaneously. So then they went on to use functional MRI and functional connectivity analyses to investigate processing in these individuals. Um, so they contrasted situations where the individuals were hearing only a single spoken sentence to conditions when they heard two sentences, two different sentences spoken simultaneously. Not surprisingly, they found activation for a bilateral set of regions, okay, 
when the person was comprehending either one message or two messages. Okay, and these represent some of the core language comprehension areas that we've seen earlier. However, the areas that you see, and, and these are shown in white, but the areas that you see in red, okay, sort of surrounding those white areas, um, were activated only when the people were comprehending two messages at the same time. Note that these are these um, areas that were involved, that were recruited only when comprehending two messages surround these core language areas. And this implies that additional cortex is recruited um, as task demands increase. But they also did functional connectivity analyses and that revealed a really interesting change in the network dynamics under the dual message condition. Okay. And here, the network activity became more synchronous or more tightly coupled or correlated when they were listening to two messages simultaneously. Okay. The functional connectivity increased between frontal and temporal areas within a hemisphere as well as for corresponding areas across hemispheres. Furthermore, they found a really interesting individual difference in that this increase in synchrony within the network was greatest for the people who had the lowest working, verbal working memory capacity, okay? So this suggests that when the language system is challenged by increased demands, functional connectivity within the network increases, again demonstrating the very dynamic nature of the system responding as changes in um, demands occur. Language can also, language experience definitely differs across individuals. And the current evidence suggests that this can also modulate the brain networks that were used for language. So Zhu and colleagues studied individuals whose native language was Mandarin Chinese. Half of the people they tested were monolingual in Mandarin and half were bilingual in a second language and the second language was Chinese Sign Language. When they were bilingual in the, um, China, in the Chinese Sign Language, they learned the Chinese Sign Language later in life, well after the original language networks would have been established for their um, first language. So the question these investigators asked was whether experience with a second signed language could alter the brain organization for the first language. Okay. So in this study, both of the groups, the monolinguals and the bilinguals, named pictures in Mandarin, their first language, and they were equally accurate at doing so. Using fMRI, they obtained similar bilateral networks um, when, uh, during this task, again, for both monolinguals and bilinguals. But there were two interesting additional findings that suggested that learning a second language alters the brain organization for the first language. First, the bilinguals had greater activation for several regions within the right hemisphere. And second, functional connectivity was observed for the bilinguals, I should say increased functional connectivity was observed for the bilinguals between the regions shown um, in this diagram. And what you're seeing in the lines here are areas that had increased functional connectivity in the bilingual um, participants. Okay. And we can see that there was increased functional connectivity both within the left hemisphere as well as between right hemisphere and these same left hemisphere areas. So even though the monolinguals and bilinguals were speaking in the same language, Mandarin, there was a somewhat different language organization based on their language experience. Or to put it another way, when two individuals perform the same language task, they may rely on differently organized brain networks due to their differences in lifetime language experience. So I've covered a lot of ground um, and I'd like to close by summarizing some of the important take home messages. I hope I've convinced you that our ideas about brain organization have evolved considerably from the classical ideas of a small number of left hemisphere language centers. Broca's area and Wernicke's area are clearly important for language, but as I said at the outset, they represent just the tip of the linguistic iceberg. Modern brain imaging techniques demonstrate conclusively that many individual areas are important for normal language function. Language is not subserved by a small number of left hemisphere hotspots, 
but rather by a much more extensive constellation of regions that span both hemispheres. Second, when we take in linguistic stimuli, whether it's auditory or visual, this information is processed in parallel streams within dorsal and ventral cortex. These different pathways extract different kinds of information from the linguistic signal, and the flow of information generally proceeds in, from a posterior to anterior direction. As we've seen, the dorsal stream processing involves sequential analysis, segmentation, and sensory motor associations. Ventral stream processing involves rapid word analysis and meaning access. So any model of language in the brain has to include at least two parallel information processing circuits. Third, language is subserved by multiple functional networks. And I'd like you to consider the various linguistic activities that you might have engaged in during my talk. Hopefully you've comprehended my auditory message and as we've seen, a rather extensive bilateral network would be recruited to accomplish this. But you've also processed the visual information, um, the visual language presented in my slides, in many cases simultaneous with comprehending the auditory spoken message. You might have held parts of my talk in verbal working memory while taking written notes. Maybe you were also texting someone or talking to the person seated next to you. Perhaps some of the time you were daydreaming or imagining that you were conversing with, con conversing with a loved one or recalling what someone told you right before the talk. All of these linguistic activities will have recruited somewhat different brain networks, brain regions activated in synchrony to perform specific linguistic computations. Language isn't one thing. It's many things, and so it shouldn't be surprising that the brain organization for language is dynamic, recruiting relevant brain regions as needed. And finally, within any given language network, functional connectivity will be modulated as processing demands change. Functional connectivity can also differ across individuals based on their ability and their past experiences. And this implies a higher degree of plasticity in brain organization for language than might have been appreciated in the past. We need to begin thinking about language networks as organic and adaptive, altering their organization over time in response to linguistic experiences. This view implies that the fine tuning of language networks is an ongoing process that continues throughout our lives. Well, we still have a long way to go in exploring language organization in the brain, but I hope to at least have conveyed to you a more sophisticated view than what you see here. Thank you for your attention.